Hey there, in this video we are looking at the linear search algorithm, and this is in section 8.1 of the Gaddis C++ book. Now, in this video we're starting in on chapter 8 on searching and sorting algorithms, and boy, they are incredibly important in computer science. So I'm glad we got to this point and we can start thinking about these really fundamental procedures in computer science. Uh, linear search is one of the simpler ones, it's probably the simplest one, so it's a good place to start with, and then we can maybe compare that to some other stuff that comes later. Okay, so in this video and the next, we are specifically talking about search algorithms. And when we say that, search, we're talking about locating a particular item of interest in a list of information. Now, when we say list here, for our examples, we're gonna be talking about arrays, right? The most basic way that you can store a lot of data. Later on in the course, we'll look at more advanced ways of storing data in more sophisticated data structures. But for now, we're just sticking with the basic thing. How do you find one specific thing in a big array. So two algorithms we're going to examine in this video and the next. Uh, linear search, that's this video, and then we'll come back next time and we'll look at binary search. And as I probably clued you in into the start of the semester, this is sort of what computer science is about. You're going to have multiple competing strategies to get a particular job done, and then hopefully you'll be able to do some math to determine which one takes less time, or takes less memory or less power or something like that and make a decision about fundamentally which one is best and use that, okay? So that'll be next time. For now, we're just looking at linear search and then we'll have something to compare binary search to later. So linear search, okay? Also called the sequential search. Very simple. You're just gonna look at everything in the array one after the other and decide whether that's the one that you're looking for. So starting at the first element, you step through the array, examining each element until it locates the value that you're searching for. Okay, so if I have, for example, an array of four things, I'm gonna look at the very first thing and say, is this value the one that I'm looking for? Maybe not. And then I'll look at this. Is this the value I'm looking for? No. Is this the value that I'm looking for? Yes, well then you found it and it's done, right? Now, if the thing that you're looking for is not in the array, and sometimes that happens, you're just gonna to have to look at every single thing in the array to determine that. I'll look at this, and this, and this, and this, and if what I'm looking for has never been found, you end up and say what you're searching for isn't there. And that's a possibility as well. But so simple, you're just looking at everything one after the other in order. So here is a pseudocode expression of that algorithm. And of course, pseudocode is kind of simplified English. It's not a formal programming language, but you're basically saying in simple English what you want this algorithm to do. You might ask yourself, why are we looking at pseudocode? And computer scientists use pseudocode a lot for a couple reasons. Number one, hopefully it lets you highlight the most important things in the algorithm. There's probably a lot of details in a particular programming language that pseudocode lets us hand wave away so we just for a minute don't have to think about it and can just focus on the important stuff. Secondly, we know there's a lot of programming languages in the world, right? We're working in C++, but there are hundreds and thousands of other languages. So if we share a report or an article or a book that's written in pseudocode, we know that anybody else who's a computer scientist can translate that to their particular language. Whereas if I only provided algorithms in my particular language, maybe, I don't know, a Python programmer might not understand how C++ is written and have symbols that they're not used to seeing and get tripped up over that. So you should get in the habit of being comfortable reading and writing algorithms in pseudocode because maybe later on that becomes more and more common. Anyway, for linear search, what, this, what the pseudocode says is you're gonna have a variable for an index, right? It's a loop. And you're gonna have a variable for the index starting at zero because that's the first thing in the array, of course. Uh, this loop is happening and it's gonna keep going as long as that index is less than the number of elements, right? And you look at what's labeled list index here, the first time that'll be list number zero, the first thing. Is that value equal to the thing that I'm searching for, right? If so, return that index. So when you do find it, the way that we report that in these algorithms is to report on the index where you found it, maybe number zero. If that doesn't happen, you're gonna add one to index, come back around and you're gonna inspect the next thing, right? If it's not there, add one to index, inspect the next thing. If this value is the thing that you're looking for, again, you return this index, which in this case would be two, to say we found it in position two. Now, if you go all the way through the entire array, you drop out of that loop right there and you return negative one 
is the signal that what you're searching for is simply not in this list. That makes sense because negative one is not a legitimate index in an array, right? Arrays are indexed from zero on up. So negative one cannot be a legitimate array index for anything to be at. And that makes sense for a sentinel value really to signal this special condition that where the thing you're looking for isn't really there. Okay, so now we can take this, of course, and we can translate this algorithm to C++. And here is what it looks like in the GATA C++ book. Um, this function is being called search list. It returns an integer. Remember, that's going to be the index where you found it, or negative one if you don't find what you're looking for. This takes three parameters. It takes an integer. In this case, it's an array of integers, but you could modify this to be arrays of other stuff, of course. So here I have a, an array called list. That's marked const because it's coming in, and normally you could possibly modify that, but we don't need to, so that makes sense to mark it as const. So there's the array. Of course, there's the size of the array, the number of elements. We've said anytime you're passing an array into a function, you're going to need two parameters. There's those first two parameters. There's the array and the size. And then the third thing here is the search value, the thing that we're actually hunting for in this array. Okay, And just like the pseudocode said, you're going to have this index variable and set to zero. You're going to keep looping while the index is less than the number of elements. So if I have four things, it's going to go to zero, one, two, three, of course. And each time uh, that you're looking at something, you're going to check, is the value of list bracket index equal to the value that I'm looking for? If so, return the index, otherwise increment it. And if you go through the whole, through the whole loop, return negative one. So again, if the value is found, we return the position at which it was found, the index. If it's not found, then we return negative one as an error code. And that's not a possible array index. I will say, I mean, we could have rewritten this as a for loop, right? I mean, this basically looks a lot like a for loop, an index starting at zero, continuing while it's less than the number of elements, and then incrementing at the end. So if we had turned this into a for loop, we'd save, I guess, two lines of code here. But all the other algorithms in chapter eight are all written with while loops. So I kind of like seeing it like this so we can compare to other algorithms that come later on. All right, so for each of these algorithms to really uh, prove that we understand what's happening here, a really good exercise is in each case to hand trace the action. So I have taken that code and I've kind of minimized it. Hopefully that's still visible on screen. And we can consult that as we do this exercise here. Let's say we have an array called list, and it stores these values, 2, 3, 5, 11, 17, 23, and 29. Notice there are seven things there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah. So when you call this function, you'd have to pass in the number 7 for the number of elements. That's the size of the array. And let's say we're searching for the value 17. You can probably see right now that 17 is in that array for what it's worth. So what we're going to do here is we're going to hand trace the value of the local variable index, right? And just kind of also look at what is in list index each time for each iteration of the loop. Very, very simple, right? You can probably just see what's gonna happen here. So to hand trace this, I'd make a little table. I'd keep track of how many steps have happened so far. I'm gonna keep track of the index variable, and I'm also gonna write down what the value of list number index is each time. Okay, so start off and index gets set to zero. You go into the loop, right? I'm gonna call this step one, where the index is actually zero. Well, what's the value of list index zero, right? Well, that's actually the first thing in the array. That's this number two, right? That's the value we're looking at. So when the code gets to line 44, it's saying is list index, that's two, is that equal to the value we're searching for? Is it equal to 17? Well, that's false. So obviously, we're going to skip line 45. We're going to hit line 46. And right at the end of this particular iteration, index becomes 1. And that's what we're going to see on the next iteration. OK, so we come back around. Now, obviously, index is still less than num elements. Num elements is 7. And 1 is less than 7. So we'll go back into the body of the loop. Uh, what is list number 1? Well, that's the next thing in the in the list, right? That's actually this number three. So you get to hit uh, line 44, is three equal to 17? Well, false. So once again, you're gonna skip number 45, you're gonna hit line 46, 
And on the next iteration, index will be, of course, two. Okay, come back around. So this is step three that we're going through now, where the index is two. Uh, list index two, of course, that's the five. Is five equal to 17? Well, no, okay? So you increment it again. In step four, you now have index at three. So you're actually inspecting the 11 on line 44 here. Is 11 equal to 17? No. Okay, so you're going to increment index again, and on step 5, index will be 4, and the fourth index into the array is actually the number 17. So this time, when you get to line 44, is 17 equal to 17? Well, of course, that's true. Now you're going to run line 45, and you are going to return, jump out of this function back to the caller, and you're going to return what number? Maybe you can say it. It's going to be four, right? We're returning the index of where we found it. So this function does correctly state we are finding what you looked for, the 17, and we found it in the fourth index. And that's how this function works. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, the basic idea is very simple. You're just looking at everything in the array one after the other and deciding whether that's the value they're looking for. Okay. There you go. So some trade-offs for linear search. What are the pros and cons of that? The benefits, boy, that's the easiest algorithm you'll ever see to understand as far as searching sorting goes, right? And compared to what's going to come next, the array can be in any, in any order. That example I just gave just happened to have the numbers in increasing order, but it doesn't have to be. The numbers could be all scrambled up, and you'll just hunt for every single thing in the array, and if you run into what you need, you'll find it. No problem. Okay, the disadvantage is, is that you will see that this is a fairly slow algorithm. If what I'm looking for isn't in the list, if I have four things, I'm going to have to look at every single thing before I discover that, right? And for four things, that's not going to take too long. But consider a situation where, let's say I'm working at Amazon, right? And they have a giant database of every single transaction that's ever happened in the entire history of the company. That's probably going to be 10 billion or 15 billion transactions over the years. And so if someone asks for a particular order and they were um, confused for a second and that order didn't actually ever happen, you, you would have to hunt through this 10 billion item database and look at every single thing before you discover that it wasn't there. Or if it is there and it just happens to be near the end of the list, you'll be waiting for quite a long time as the computer looks at every single thing in the entire list 10 billion times long. So uh, hopefully we can do better than that. Hopefully we can come up with an algorithm that's better than look at every single thing one after the other, because for heavy duty work, that would take longer than we would ever want to deal with. Okay, and that's linear search. So maybe it'll be something that comes later that will be better than that. Pretty good. So if you're uh, in what my uh, class actually registered as a student at CUNY Kingsboro, next time we're in person, we would probably do this lab. Uh, we would get a pre-made program that has a linear search algorithm. It's already complete. Probably test that to make sure that it works. That lab starts off searching an array of characters, right? Now the example in the lecture was an array of integers, but it could be anything. So this lab comes with a search of an array of characters and then our job in the lab will be to modify that so it searches an array of strings instead. Now, the little secret about this lab, and I guess I'll give it away before we actually do it, is that this is going to be incredibly easy because C++ has overloaded the relational operators, right? The key thing in the linear search was that equal sign where you check the current value compared to the thing you're searching for, that equal sign. And so the equal sign works for numbers like integers, it works for characters, and it's also been expanded or technically called overloaded. It does the exact same thing for strings as well. That probably wouldn't be the case in some other languages actually, but um, working in C++, the work is basically gonna automatically happen anyway because the equal sign, the double equal sign works on strings just like anything else. So uh, in this lab, you'll find it isn't that much work because the way that the code's already written just basically works automatically. Now, later on in the course in chapter 14, we'll talk about overloading operators and we'll see how we can make that happen ourselves. But for now, it's already been done for strings and that's why this lab's gonna be extremely simple. 
So we'll look forward to doing that if you're in person in my class. So I think that's a pretty good summary of the linear search. And when we come back next time, we will be looking at binary search and we'll get to compare at the end there and see which one is better. So I'll see you then for that.